All right, good morning, everyone. Our afternoon, kind of in between. Um, I'm Chanel Hardy. I'm head of civil rights for Google, and I'm honored to be here with you all today for this important discussion on environmental justice and ensuring clean air and water for all communities in America. Before I came to Google, I had the honor of building my policy skills on the Hill um, as a counsel and later a chief of staff to a member of the Congressional Black Caucus, um, and then as chief of policy for the National Urban League. So being here at the CBCF annual legislative conference is always a wonderful homecoming. And so it is um, a great honor to be able to introduce our majority whip today, um, along with this dynamic panel. And on a personal note, I want to acknowledge that these are not easy days for our community. Um, and sir, every time we turn on the television and see you advocating for us with power and dignity and hope, it makes it a little bit better. So I want to thank you. Um, and of course, all of us want to thank um, Majority Whip Clyburn for your leadership on issues of environmental justice, leadership with, which is absolutely consistent with your lifetime of work at the forefront of every issue impacting our community and all communities seeking equity and opportunity, whether we are talking about the economy, the criminal justice system, or the right to vote. And even closer to home for Google, we have been particularly appreciative of your leadership on providing access to broadband for so many who have gone without. In particular, we want to thank you for your insight and your advocacy, which was critical in leading to a first-of-its-kind uh, project to wire school buses with internet so that school children could do their schoolwork during very long drives in the school bus to and from school. Um, so Google is proud to call you a friend. I also want to thank um, EPA Administrator Regan and his team for the passion and dedication that you have brought to your work to advance environmental, ju environmental justice. Since his time as Secretary of the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality, the administrator has led with innovative solutions to center the people and communities most impacted by pollution and climate change. Administrator Regan's team recently joined with Google and other EJ leaders to highlight the state of environmental justice at the United Nations General Assembly in New York. And of course, the EPA just announced a new Office of Environmental Justice and External Civil Rights this week. Unfortunately, the administrator is home with COVID today, but we are absolutely thrilled that he has sent his dynamic leadership team, a black leadership team, I might add. Um, so thank you, um, Associate Administrator Rosemary and Obakari for being here. Um, Rosemary and I go back a long time. She's been fighting for the community for a long time. It's great to see you here. And thank you to Robin Collins, Senior Advisor, Daniel Blackman, Regional Four Administrator, and Dorian Blythers, Deputy Chief of Staff. And I want to thank all of you who are working to address climate change and environmental justice in your own communities and who have made the time to join us for today's important conversation. Right now, we're in a moment of immense opportunity for environmental justice. We're seeing historic investments. Of course, the Biden administration has identified environmental justice as a key area for its climate agenda and has established the Justice 40 Initiative, a pledge to deliver at least 40% of the overall benefits from federal investments in climate to frontline communities. Recently, Google announced a $9 million, first of its kind, environmental justice fund to provide technological and data capacity to environmental justice groups to unlock resources for the communities we serve. If you know of any organizations that apply for these funds, we encourage you to visit environmentaljusticefund.com. We are glad to play a small part in this enormous challenge, but we know there's still so much work to do to address the disproportionate burden of pollution and to ensure clean air and clean water for all. I don't have to remind anyone here of the life and death consequences of the water crisis in Flint or what's going on in Mississippi. Black Americans are 75% more likely than others to live near facilities that produce hazardous waste, and that's not okay. So I'm honored to be here. I'm looking forward to this timely conversation, and I ask that you all join me in giving a very, very warm welcome to the majority whip, James Clyburn. Thank you, Ms. Hardy. Thank you very much for uh, your uh, being here today. And thank you to Google uh, for uh, its innovative uh, work uh, on behalf 
of our young people who are being challenged, especially at a time when the entire country and world is being challenged in a way that many of us thought was behind us. Uh, thank you. When you talk about Google and the buses, um, I was in Somerton uh, day before yesterday, or was it yesterday, I think, day before yesterday, I think. Somerton, South Carolina, where Brown v. Board of Education got started. Uh, if many of you uh, studied this, you know that Brown v. Board of Education was not about integrating schools. The case started as Briggs v. Elliott, and it was about getting kids school buses in Somerton, South Carolina. And you talked about the long drive that a lot of our young people are on these days and uh, equipping these buses so that they can do their homework while taking long bus rides. Think about this. Brown v. Board of Education got started because the kids in Clarendon County, South Carolina, were walking nine and a half miles to school every morning and nine and a half miles back home in the afternoon. That's what the lawsuit was about, just to get some buses so those kids could go to and fro to school. And so we've come a long, long way, but we still have some distance to travel. Now, we're getting restarted uh, with our, just all of ALC. It's been three years, uh, and as you can tell, uh, we usually have separate rooms to do these uh, events in where we all could come in and equip the room as others have their events, brain trusts, et cetera, going on in other rooms. They've done it this way because we are trying to reprogram ourselves. Uh, and so we are here for some uh, inconveniences today. Uh, it feels real funny uh, to be talking to uh, uh, a room uh, this big with uh, uh, a few people. When we had the old room, this number here would look pretty good. You know, we can kind of stack them all into a small room. But thank you all so much for being here. I want to give some thanks uh, to a few people today and acknowledge the founder of this brain trust. Uh, this brain trust was born out of a conversation I had with the late uh, Dr. David Rivers. Uh, David and I had grown to be great friends and I was running the brain trust on environmental justice. I wanted to start this brain trust on environmental justice. And one of the reasons I really wanted to do it is because um, I noticed that uh, some of the conversation that was going on was pushing people away. Uh, even the name, and many of you may recall, everybody seemed to rebel in talking about environmental racism. And yes, that's what it was, and that's what it still is. But in order to solve these problems, we needed to come up with approaches that will bring people into the effort. And one of the things we had to do is come with a different title. And so we had to start, uh, and that's where environmental justice was born. And we thought about all of these environmental issues and how to merge the issues of health uh, into all of this. So as a result, I called on the expertise and the passion of David Rivers, who then brought the Medical University of South Carolina into the process, and people like Lloyd Moore, uh, who is here, uh, thank you so much, Lord, uh, for your work. Uh, Letitia Abraham Halea, uh, thank you. Uh, still connected with the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you all so much uh, for continuing this effort. Uh, Denise Freeman, uh, thank you uh, for all that you've done. And Dr. Melinda Dowling, uh, the, kind of the glue uh, that has kept all of this together. Uh, thank you so much. Now, you have uh, met uh, the... Uh, been introduced to the panelists, and I'm not going to go back through their names, uh, but I got to bring them up here. And I was hoping not to go back through their names because the very first name I've got here 
uh, is Rosemary in the back here. And I'm going to say that fast enough uh, to be right. Rosemary, come on up. And then she's going to be Dorian Paul Blithers. I can do Blithers. Come on up. Daniel Blackman. Come on up. And Robin Morris Collin. These four people, now, as you've just heard, um, uh, the EPA administrator with whom I have been doing events all across the country with, uh, is, uh, is, is where I was uh, a year or so ago, uh, battling COVID-19. Uh, but um, uh, I don't know how long. He is supposed to be my guest uh, at the um, dinner on Saturday night. Uh, and I know how many shots he's had and how many I've had. Uh, I ain't going to take any risk. So y'all tell him, I said, please get well soon, but stay away from the dinner uh, on the on Saturday night. I'll catch him sometime next week. Uh, with that, let me go over here, and we're going to get started with the discussion. I'm going to, I don't know how or who, since you've got the, the easy sounding name, uh, Ms. Rosemary, we're going to start uh, with you. Give us a little bit of your feeling about where we are with environmental justice issues today, where the new department, and that's what I'm calling, not a new department, but new leadership of an old department, uh, where you are attempting to take us uh, in the next few years. So for me, uh, I was, as a person who was in, at the EPA under the Obama administration, um, and also at the EPA now under the Biden administration, I can say we've come a long way. Um, environmental justice was something that, you know, we wanted to lean into, we thought was a priority, but under President Biden and under Administrator Regan, I have seen the investments that we're making to ensure that we are correcting the wrongdoings of communities from across the country um, uh, during this administration. Administration, Administrator Regan is really leaning in to make sure that as we think about things like science, that environmental justice is on that same equal footing, right? Because we need to make sure that as we do this work, we're thinking about the most vulnerable um, and ensuring that we think about that first and not as an afterthought. Because oftentimes we've seen that environmental justice was an afterthought. Um, but with Administrator Regan and President Biden, I've seen that we've come a long way, and we still have a long way to go. Um, just this Saturday, last Saturday, Administrator Regan announced um, the opening of the Office of Environmental Justice and External Civil Rights. Um, and that is massive. For the community, it was a long time coming. Um, and it's, it's, it's putting the work of environmental justice on the same footing as the work that we're doing around clean air, clean water, healthy land, science. And for communities, that's massive, to ensure that we, environmental justice not only has a seat at the table, but also a voice in the conversation is, is, is such a long way um, coming. And, and I'll turn it to Robin Collins here, who you know, has really leaned in on the work that we're doing on environmental justice, as she is the administrator's senior advisor for environmental justice. Thank you. We began our work under the Biden-Harris administration early with a commitment at EPA to put environmental justice at the core and the center of everything that we do. Every program, every practice, every action, every region. And that's something that was new because, as you know, EPA inherited an organization that was siloed. So it tended to think about environmental, environmental issues in terms of air or water or land as if they were separate. What we began with Administrator Regan is to say we want the community's lived experience to be the lens through which all of our work is seen. 
That was something profound, and he demanded that we make those commitments, real commitments from every single program, every single region, to make environmental justice part of everything we do. And he also gave me the job to check in on them and make sure they do it. So I am honored to be here and have this opportunity as we finally proceed from faith to resources. Oh my goodness, thank you so much to the CBC for your leadership in giving us the resources at last. Well, thank you so much. As many of you probably know, uh, this environmental justice movement, irrespective of what we may have called it back then, really was uh, grounded in activities that took place uh, in the state of North Carolina, or let's say the lack of activities that took place there. And I think it's fitting and proper uh, to have an African American from North Carolina now heading up this institution uh, and showing appreciation for that history. Now, which of them do you want to talk about Justice 40? I think that's mine. That's yours? <laughs> well, tell us about it. Justice 40 is an historic promise that the president made from his early days. He said that 40% from certain federal investments would flow to disadvantaged communities. So what has happened in the meantime is that the CEQ, the Council on Environmental Quality, is the White House leadership on this historic commitment. And the uh, categories of federal investments that are part of this historic promise are, let me just, let me just name them for you. I won't try to rush through it, but climate change, clean energy and energy efficiency, clean transit, affordable and sustainable housing, training and workforce development, remediation and reduction of legacy pollution, and development of clean water and wastewater infrastructure. So we had this commitment that 40% of all of the investments in those areas would come to disadvantaged communities. After that commi commitment was made, all of a sudden the money started to flow. And we're talking significant amounts of money. First there was the ARPA, the American Recovery Act. I don't know if I have that right, ARPA. Yeah. And then... The ARP is what we call it, that's it. Yeah. It's the American Recovery Plan. Plan. ARP. ARP. Thank you, sir. Okay. And then there was the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. And then there was IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act. All in all, that put 100 billion, as the administrator likes to point out, that's with a B, 100 billion dollars into our work. We had never had money like that before. That was this, this is exponentially more money than we'd ever had. But I tell you, I believe that it was because we started first with the commitment to environmental justice. We didn't know that the money was going to be there, but thank you. Well, you're quite welcome. Now, Dorian, uh, you and Daniel uh, are left out of this introductory here. And uh, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, uh, Whip Clyburn. I, I, I want to say something um, that the administrator often says to our leadership, um, and, and that's about environmental justice. And we at uh, the agency, and most agencies are no stranger to acronyms, um, but the, the saying goes that under Administrator Regan's leadership, uh, we are injecting e EJ uh, into the DNA of everything at EPA, um, which, which you know underscores everything that, that Rosemary and Robin just shared. Um, a part of my role at the agency uh, is determining and helping advise uh, where the administrator is showing up across the country and across the globe. Um, the communities that we're, we're stepping into um, haven't seen an administrator uh, in some cases like the Bronx, New York in nearly 20 years. Um, administrator Regan is not afraid of having the tough conversations and really bringing the administration uh, and this leadership team, this agency, along what he has called uh, uh, J to J, our, our 
journey to justice, um, which is an acknowledgement that uh, this work has been going on for decades um, and that we must continue to push it forward in a way that will get us closer and closer to, uh, to justice, which is what we are all seeking. Um, but uh, I, I can't underscore uh, how important it is that we have uh, Administrator Regan at the helm right now and the authority that President Biden has given him to take environmental justice to the next level. And with these resources, the billion with the B, um, we have the opportunity to do that. For the first time in a long time, a regulatory agency now just uh, doesn't have a stick, but there's a carrot as well. And that's going to play out very well in communities that look like those that we come from seated here today. Well, thank you very much for that. We don't want to leave you out in the introduction, Chair. So, no problem. No, I, I got it. I th okay. I, th I think for you know the the one thing that I do want everyone to look at is this stage. When we talk about environmental justice and we talk about climate, and you look at the fact that the administrator is an alum of North Carolina A&T, the first black man to serve as administrator of EPA. I'm an alum of Clark Atlanta University, um, so I'm very proud to Who's know your that. What's that? And a, a Howard University as well, okay. the vice president. But, but, you know, I think it's important for us to recognize the fact that this is not only a historic time as it relates to Justice 40 and what was mentioned today. Um, in my region, Region 4, I'm the first black male to be the regional, regional administrator in um, the majority of the southern states. We have 56 percent of the historically black colleges in the United States that are in Region 4. And it means a lot for us to know that not only do we have those communities, but we also have six federally recognized tribes. So I think it's important when we think of environmental justice, and as Robin so eloquently stated, it's very important for you all to know that it's not just the reflection of leadership that is represented on this stage, but it's also the fact that we have resources to get into these communities to solve some of these problems, whether it's the Black Belt in Alabama or it's in, uh, you know, Jackson, Mississippi. There's so many challenges that we're able to face and address in this very historic moment. But the leadership that we're gonna, that we're gonna take away from today comes from people sitting in this room, but also the leadership of Whip Clyburn and, and all the work that we're working on and that we're doing here within the agency. Thank you for that. You know, I would mention that now, they've given me an amount of time that I'm supposed to uh, ask questions and then go to you. But we also have two issues at play here, number one, We've got a hard stop when we got to get out of this room so the other small crowd can get into this big room uh, uh, at 1 o'clock. And the other is we're still voting on the, uh, uh, over on the Hill, and things may come up that require us. As you know, the government shuts down uh, Friday, tomorrow evening if we don't get some bills passed uh, by this time tomorrow. So that may interrupt us. So I'm going to be giving up some of my time so that we can um, go to you and let you have the time that I would ordinarily be taking. But I just want to say this. Um, I mentioned Summerton, South Carolina earlier, where Brown v. Board of Education got started. Now, what Jackson, Mississippi, and not just Flint, Flint, Michigan, has overshadowed Highland Park. Highland Park in Michigan, uh, same problem. Summerton, South Carolina, their entire water system went down. Uh, schools, businesses, everything. It's all been overshadowed by Jackson. Uh, but these issues are still with us. And that's why having people committed to these kinds of communities, very important, because all these communities got one thing in common, and I think we know what that is. The head of all of these eight of these companies, the mayor in Jackson, Highland Park, Flint, and Summerton, all African American. And decisions are being made that limit their ability to do what needs to be done for their people. So when you do 40% and say there's got to go into these disadvantaged communities and set up the uh, uh, policies and procedures correctly, uh, we can address these problems because at the top of most of these states, 
uh, or people whose sensitivity uh, just ain't there. Mr. Whip, can I add? Sure. Not only 40% comes to disadvantaged communities. 100% of that money must be spent in ways that don't recreate racism. They must not resuscitate racism. And that's the civil rights law of this country. It has been the civil rights law of this country for more than 60 years. We must not use any of that money to recreate racism. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. And I think it's very, very important because that kind of policy will not be in the headlines. What's in the headlines and what people are making their decisions on about what may or may not be taking place with this administration just based upon false premises. This administration has made a commitment unlike any uh, in the history of the country. I would, I would defy anybody, if you took the American Rescue Plan that you just talked about, the bipartisan infrastructure bill that you just talked about, throw in the chips and science bill that we have not talked about, and the Inflation Reduction Act that we did talk about. These four pieces of legislation are unrivaled by anything that has passed the Congress under any administration since the great society programs of Lyndon Baines Johnson. And those are facts. Those are facts. And if you were to throw in there the PAC Act, and one of the things I said to a group the other day when we did the PAC Act, and we said, okay, all of these uh, soldiers coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan that were exposed to burn pits, environmental justice, exposed to burn pits. We are dealing with that in the PAC Act, but we also went back and picked up all of those people who did not get properly uh, dressed with Agent Orange after the Vietnam War. We picked that up in this bill. I would hope that people will start looking at this legislation and stop listening to these tweeters and twatters whatever they are, and just look at what we are doing. That's what they are fighting against. They, they're looking at it. They know what we're doing. They see what we're doing, and they are misrepresenting time and time again. So this stuff is real that these people are doing. And with that, who's got the first question or observation? Uh, I see a hand over here. Hey, hey, Willie, we got it. Can we get in the mics out here? What do we got to do to get to people? Uh, just uh, well, come forward. I'll give you my mic. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Congressman. I'm Shirley Harrington, and I'm hailing from the great state of Mississippi. I know where you're from. I am going to ask the hardest question you may have. Our governor has already decided that funds that were allocated by HUD for citizens who should and need housing, that they would not be allowed those rental allowances. The president said to the governor just two weeks ago when EPA had first hit the ground and FEMA hit the ground about water, that he better distribute the funds to Jackson. We have already gotten indications that he does not intend to do so. So my question is between the legislative branch and the executive branch, what are you going to do to help us with these denials from governors? We're going to do whatever the law allows us to do. As you know, you and I have known each other for a long time. My closest friend in the United States Congress is Benny Thompson. And I don't think anybody will call him uh, a withering violet. Uh, he's as tough as they come. He and I talk every day, every day. We've had long discussions about your governor. Uh, and we've had some discussions about some other people that I, whose names I won't mention. Uh, but we are following that very closely. But that's not the only state. 
that we are following to make sure that they follow the law. Remember, he chairs the January 6th committee, but I chair the coronavirus select committee uh, or subcommittee uh, overseeing all of those expenditures. And I can tell you, uh, uh, Benny and I both have been issuing subpoenas and we don't mind doing it. And, and I can also add to that for sure. Administrator Regan. Sure. Um, so one of the things that Administrator Regan has, has said time and time again is that he will not allow, if the money that, that, that is coming from the Environmental Protection Agency that goes to the state, if they don't prioritize it for communities of need, which we have clearly laid out what that means in a letter to the governor from the administrator, if half of that money does not go to those communities, the administrator will hold the money. Uh, we'll keep it at the agency. We'll withhold federal funds from the state, which is a problem for states like Mississippi that don't, that don't have other entities like corporations and others bringing in dollars into the state. So states like Mississippi rely on federal funding. And so for the administrator to withhold that is, is a lot of leverage. And so he has committed to that. Um, and especially for Jackson specifically, you know, we were in Jackson two weeks ago, but the administrator also just went to Jackson earlier this week. And, you know, we had a conversation and we are working together with the city to be able to find not just long-term solutions, but near-term solutions to fix Jackson's water situation um, so that we can make sure that we are accountable to the community um, and provide the safe drinking water that these communities need. And I'm a daughter of Jackson, um, so I understand. And this is personal for me and for the administrator. And so one of the things that we talk about is transparency and accountability. And so we, this Office of Environmental justice is doing just that, making sure that we are accountable to the communities on the ground. Yes, sir. All right, so thank you for that. Uh, my question, but, but let me just introduce myself. I'm Todd Shern from Benton Harbor, Michigan, and we have a problem with legacy contamination. But one of the things that's a little different from Mississippi is that we have the full cooperation of the state of Michigan and Governor Gretchen Whitmer. So just want to thank her for that and acknowledge that. In my city, we had challenges with lead service lines, and they actually had to replace all the lead service lines in the entire city. So I just want to thank you. But to your environmental justice initiative, Justice 40, we have challenges with legacy contamination from a plating company that dissolved 50 years ago and has contaminated a creek in the middle of the city. And so we're in the process of trying to remediate. But my question is, are there some services or programs that we can take advantage of and leverage? Because the city needs technical assistance and it also needs the remediation of habitats and of the water itself. Thank you. Thank you. So there are substantial sums of money available to help you and, and the Office of Environmental Justice and External Civil Rights, OEJ ECR, is setting up and has set up regional technical assistance centers. We call them Tic Tacs. You can find the link to them online on the EPA website. Technical, they're thriving communities technical assistance centers, and they exist to help cities and also organizations connect to the funding that's available, not just for one program, but for a whole constellation of programs that are now available to help with the environment, with human health, with water, with all of these interlocking problems that our communities have. They aren't siloed. So see me afterwards. I'll make sure that you get the link. That's what it's there to do. Thank you. Benton Harbor, Michigan is a quintessential example of what's needed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. My name is Tamara Tolzo Laughlin. I'm the CEO and president of the Environmental Grantmakers Association and the founder of Climate Critical Earth. I'm also one of the tweeters that you mentioned. Um, so with all due respect to this distinguished panel, I'd like to flag that the folks who on uh, social media who are communicating about the nuance in the largest climate bill in history to be passed are people who are members of our community. They're black folks inside of think tanks. They're black folks who've dedicated 20, 30, 40, or five years of their career to understanding the policy levers that should go along with mobilizing and community building. So I think it might be a better way to start a multi-generational conversation to not minimize your own community. 
I also want to flag that uh, the, although the IRA is really important, there are considerations that are not about the style with which it came to us, but about how the policy itself will be implemented. Because as you well know, a giant piece of policy isn't the same as regulatory framework or enforcement or any of the other agencies that will have to be implicated. Department of Energy, Department of Interior, U.S. Agriculture. There are black people deep in those places and out in communities waiting for them to make sure that it isn't just that Justice 40 exists alongside IRA, but that the funds are subject to Justice 40. So would love to have a conversation about that and maybe a relationship building uh, bridge rather than an insult on social media, because I'm going to tweet that too. Well, please be sure that we hear about the EPA. Department of Agriculture is taking place, other places. Everybody is doing something. And I don't think any of us are minimizing this. I still live at 501 Juniper Street in Columbia, South Carolina. I think there may be three white people that vote in my precinct. And so I, I remain committed to this community. If, if I could add to, so respectfully to your point, you know, many of us on this stage have a civil rights and grassroots background. I'm very familiar with your organization. I think what, what needs to be understood more than anything else to audiences like this is Dorian and um, uh, my colleague just mentioned that when you think about journey to justice, we started off in difficult rooms. We started off by going into uh, uh, Mississippi and to Jackson well before the press was there, having conversations that were uncomfortable. And what, you, what I think is important for these conversations, number one, we're available after this conversation, but I think it speaks volumes when you think of the regional administrators in place. If you were to see the amount of women of color, the amount of, the amount of men of color, the, the, the way in which Administrator Regan has set this up is to be able to be in those rooms with those challenges. And to your point, it's not enough for us to just be able to have a regulatory or enforcement policy that's in place. We need to do a better job on three areas. Number one is with technical assistance and making sure we work with communities that see those barriers and challenges. Number two, making sure people like you and your voices are in the room. There's a quote I have in my office that says, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu, right? So if we're not bringing more people into these conversations, then our work will not be measured based on just the bipartisan infrastructure or IRA. We have to make sure that the resources available are getting to the communities and the people they need to. And we're going to always improve because of our leadership and Administrator Regan's commitment to what we have to do. And then thirdly, really quickly, because I know we're short on time, I think what's most important is to understand what Whip Clyburn said earlier. There has not been in my lifetime, in many of our lifetimes, this type of resources available in a moment in history where folks that come from many of these communities are responsible to make sure that the communities that we are serving, that we're committed to and that we're working for, are able to have access to these funds. And I saw it firsthand in Lowndes County, Alabama. Same issues, same concerns with sanitation equity and water infrastructure. We went there right before Selma. We returned a couple months later with a check because we listened to the communities. They were uncomfortable. There were hard conversations, but we had to make sure that we were doing exactly what we were committed to, which is showing up for these grassroots organizations and EJ communities that so desperately need our help. So thank you. Thank you. Next question. <clears throat> Hello. Um, my name is Adedara Denny. I'm the CB, uh, CBCF fellow. Uh, I'm doing my fellowship right now in Nikemia Williams' office. Um, environmental justice is a big passion of mine, uh, so very, very thankful for this, uh, for this uh, discussion. And um, my question in regards to this is mainly in regards to the, the infrastructure bill that you guys mentioned. Um, and like, we know that the infrastructure bill was a major part of the, uh, the environmental justice funding. Um, and we know that the United States and the Biden administration is doing a lot to move forward into like renewable energy sources, um, electric vehicles, and climate resilient infrastructure. Um, my concern is that the, uh, the black community is being left in this technological uh, green revolution, um, especially when, when it comes to electric cars and solar panels, uh, because moving the, the, the pollution from one area to another area is not condu conductive to a, uh, an actual solution. Um, so like, what avenues, programs, or policies are possible to ensure that the, the green revolution is equitable uh, so black people aren't commercially uh, left behind? Dorian? Thank you for the, thank you for that 
excellent question. Um, specifically looking at the bipartisan infrastructure law, I think that uh, there's a huge opportunity for us to discuss um, the equity that is already injected and in what that bill is supposed to do. Um, we talked a little bit about replacing lead service lines across the country. You all have likely seen Administrator Regan really on a road show with Vice President Harris going into communities uh, working to, uh, to begin to replace those lead service lines across the country. Um, but the other thing that we're about to see take place, um, which is already yielding fruit from the bipartisan infrastructure law that's going to directly impact our communities, is uh, our effort to decarbonize the nation's school bus fleet. Right? So we think about the dirty diesel buses that are, are uh, in our communities. Uh, we think about what is also happening with other heavy duty uh, vehicles in our communities, which are oftentimes located near ports, near transit centers. Um, the policies, um, when, you, when you get into the bipartisan infrastructure law, um, are really here in our communities to, uh, to address that specifically. Um, and, and I'm excited about what we're going to see in the coming months when these buses, uh, which are now electric, um, are going to be rolling through our community so that we can have, uh, of course, cleaner air uh, to breathe. But um, one thing that I would, would uh, encourage us to do um, is to continue to go back to our communities and talk about these things when we see, when we see these buses in our communities um, and, and continue this dialogue, which is, is critical. Um, I don't think that we're at all being left behind. I think that we are actually at the center of what this is. Our communities are hit first and worst, and the bipartisan infrastructure law was set up to address that directly. And if I can add really quickly, if you, look, if you think about what the President as well as Administrator Regan has committed to as a whole of government approach, so we have interagency collaboration between the Department of Energy, um, USDA, so when you, even when you talk about, to your point about the, the challenges and the barriers, the Department of Energy, we're working with them on electric vehicle charging stations, looking at um, what is being created in these areas. Dorian mentioned earlier about the clean school bus program. That's a huge area that I think has opportunity in it. But people like yourself, we have it goes both ways, right? So when we share the information, we need people like you to help to spread that message outside of this room. In the state of Georgia, where I reside, we have 181 school districts that um, in the state, but we, 141 of the 181 school districts have 30% or higher of students living at or below poverty, right? So when you think of the transformative opportunities that Robin Collin mentioned earlier about our new Office of Environmental Justice, there are opportunities for people like you to be in the room to share those concepts and ideas, but we have to accelerate it because many of the communities that these, pro these policies and programs will benefit they're not even applying. So we have to do a better job at the EPA to make sure that they have their SAMS number, to make sure that they know about it, they're aware. But then individuals like you have to bring more of your colleagues into the room so that we can engage them with other agencies and support the effort so that the next decade looks a lot better than the previous one. One additional point that I wanted to make um, just on the, um, uh, the offering around taking advantage of the opportunity for our communities is one of the president's first executive orders was actually on advancing equity uh, in the federal government. Um, that has taken, uh, th that with that charge, our agency uh, had to take a look from the bottom to the top. Every single piece of our operations had to be evaluated through an equity lens. Um, that's contracts and procurement, that's research and development, where those dollars go and who has an opportunity to access those contracts that are going to serve uh, our communities and our agencies um, are, are all uh, in consideration. Uh, so we have that opportunity, uh, which is also going to be implemented, implemented excuse me, over the next two to four years. Thank you. Hi, my name is Makia Little, and um, I just wanted to kind of spring off of what uh, the previous brother who spoke stated and also uh, let my sister here know that I see her as well. And I think there is an assignment that we can all uh, take from this, which is, yes, you all are in your roles of leadership and, and advocating for change reform, uh, but we are the community who have our own microphones. And what we can do to help uh, uh, bridge the ger generational communication divide is leverage our skills. I'm a, I'm a comms major as well, right? And take these conversations, as he just said, 
and make them accessible to those in our generation. We are in this room, we are obviously interested in recipients of the information, but what are we doing with it after to support our community? We can all do that. We all have that power after uh, CBCI. Uh, Brother Clyburn talked about the tweeters and the twatters. And so I went home and I became a tweeter and a twatter and I made some graphic tiles and called it my lessons from Tunica and amplified the fact that 45 HBCUs benefited from having their federal debt wiped out and that HUD uh, removed the, the F, um, student loan debt uh, is, a, is a factor with FHA loans. And so we can amplify the lessons that we're learning here with our own platforms, our own Twitter handles, um, and combat the uh, tweeters and twatters who really don't have our best interests at heart. That's what he was referring to, sis. Could I just underscore at one point, thank you so much for the comment. Um, I wanted to ask everybody in this room to get the word out. We have been blessed with resources, but I wake up in the middle of the night, no lie, worried that we won't be able to spend the money or that it won't go where it's supposed to go. And we cannot on this stage ensure that without your help, and all of the tweeters who want to tweet information to connect us to the resources. We need you to do that positive work. We absolutely have to have that kind of cooperation coming back to meet us in the middle. Thank you so much. Right. Yes, sir. Thank you very Please much. Please step forward another step so we can see you. Good. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank, you. thank you very much. Just let me introduce myself very briefly. I'm uh, Judge Peter Herbert from the United Kingdom but uh, living in Kenya. And can I give you then a CBC greetings from the diaspora in Kenya and the United Kingdom. I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Congressman, Congresswoman uh, Joyce Beatty with a diaspora group in March of this year. So it's at her invitation we came back. The, the, the question is simply this. Kenya passed some amazingly strong legislation against the uh, removal of chemicals and plastics on the whole of the continent. We understand that the American Chemistry Council, made up of large part of industrial tech companies and oil companies, are seeking to undermine that stance and to increase the trade of a dumping effectively of plastics and oil products on the continents through Kenya. And we are keen, given the progress that we've made in East Africa, that we don't become the repository in a sense for what America does not want to have on its back doors. So whilst this is an international question, we, we would please ask that you use your very best efforts to help us keep that part of the continent clean. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can, can I say something to the... Yeah, yeah so, so really, really quickly, first of all, sir, thank you for that statement. And I, I want to first um, tell you that we're doing everything from our vantage point that we can do, and I'm sure the congressman and our Senate can address that further. But to the question that was asked, the, the statement more so that was before, Robin made a really good point. I, I really, if you all don't take anything else away from this conversation today, um, what Clyburn mentioned it earlier, there's so much successes that are happening that our communities are not aware of, right? And that is a two-way street. And for those of you that are in this room that have the access to communities and organizations and group, um, Administrator Regan, as a personal note, and myself, we're fathers, right? We're committed to this work. We are doing phenomenal jobs, but we are spending so much time away from our homes into areas like this uh, at historically black colleges in cities like Jackson. And what's happening is that we are overwhelmingly committed as an agency to make sure that the community knows about this work. But we're only as strong as those of you that are in this room that are partnering with us to get the word out, whether it's the 50.4 billion for water infrastructure in cities that need lead pipe replacement or wastewater management, or it's the $5 billion committed to wastewater management. Go on to our website, and I need you all to know what your states are getting. In states like Florida, they're getting 270 million dollars a year for the next five years. Georgia's getting 158 million per year for the next five years. Mississippi's getting 75 million. Know what's coming into your states because the work that we're doing 
and the information that we're giving you is to make sure that we can help to hold these state partners accountable, whether it's through agriculture, it's through uh, state partners, public health. Our goal is to make sure the resources are available, and then regional administrators like myself and my nine other colleagues have to work closely with the administrator to make sure that as these things are coming into your areas and you need the support and you need the help, we're having ongoing conversations. There's an African proverb that says, if you want to run fast, run alone. If you want to run far, run with others. This is a marathon. It's a long way to go from where we started off with the environmental justice movement over 40 years ago, and we can't get there without many of you in this room. So thank you. Could I make just one point about the international comment? Yes. Environmental justice is not a NIMBY movement. It's a nope. It goes from not in my backyard to not on planet Earth, right? We are one. We are one EJ movement. We're one movement and one planet. Thank you. Thank you. Rosemary, you want to? Yeah. You started out, and then everybody challenged you. <laughs> Um, so I'll add to, to Daniel's point, you know, we have a real opportunity here. Um, we talk about the investments that we have, the agency received from all the various bills um, and plans. We, the agency received $100 billion. Um, and just to quantify that for you guys a bit, the agency's operating budget is $10 billion a year, right? And so in this moment, we have $100 billion. That's 10 years worth of us operating. Um, and so we have such an opportunity here to really make a difference in our communities. And so partnership is really important for us. You know, my job, I do public engagement and environmental education. So I work with all the various entities out, outside of the agency in order to partner. Um, we also work with historically black colleges and uni universities, which is a priority for the administrator. He wants to build a bench of folks who can come into the agency who look like us to be able to do this work and to carry on that legacy of the work that we're doing here at the agency. And so, although Daniel said it is a marathon, it is a bit of a marathon, but it's also a sprint. Right? We don't have a whole lot of time until the end of this administration. And so we need to be able to work with you all to be able to tell folks about the work that we're doing at the agency and the things that we're trying to push forward. Um, you know, for us, I just met with the, the black lawyers uh, uh, not too long ago, and they had no idea that the agency had this much money. They had no okay. idea that they should be working with us on the work that we're doing. And so we want to be able to partner and, and engage with you all. And I'll be here after to be able to give my information to you all because, you know, we want to hear from you. We want to partner with you. We want to be able to make sure that we're working with you to tell our stories to communities. Well, thank you. Let me thank this panel uh, for I'm, I'm recognizing the heart out. Uh, we got two minutes. I'm going to take those two minutes to thank them and to thank you uh, for your uh, tenure here today. But I also want to say this. I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hands. But $100 billion dealing with environmental justice issues, uh, that's a lot of money even on Capitol Hill. And we need your help. I just left Michigan last Sunday, Sunday before last day. They're fighting over, they got seven billion dollars out of the rescue plan that's left over and they're trying to figure out what to do with it and every state has got the same issue every state we had, if you look at the rescue plan it's a much broader thing everybody focus on uh, child tax credit putting shots in people's arms getting schools back reopened get businesses unshuttered. They didn't look at the big pot of money that was sitting there for the local states and local communities to come up with efforts to really build a platform upon which to launch this great recovery. It is there. I'll give you one example. South Carolina is going to announce on the 3rd that 100% of its residents and businesses We'll get broadband within three to five years. How did that happen? <laughs> that happened because for the first time in an infrastructure bill, $65 billion got put in for broadband. And you're looking at 
the guy that pulled the group together and says, the broadband, when it came online, when the internet came online, y'all remember what we called it? No, we didn't. The first name for it was what? Information Highway. That was the first name, Information Highway. And I stood up in the caucus and said, we're going to treat the Information Highway the same way we treat the Interstate Highway. That's how we got them to put broadband into the infrastructure bill. And South Carolina's gonna take $400 million out of the rescue plan to add to what we got in the uh, infrastructure bill and bill out 100%. So if you all can go back to your communities, talk to people, look at that money that these states are sitting on, it's there and it came from Washington, and they are trying to decide what to do with it. And don't worry about who may be. My governor was the first one to endorse Trump. First one. He's a big Trumpster. However, I sit down with him and explain some things to him, and he is going to do, we are announcing it on the 3rd. So open up the communication, because some things are happening out there now. We can get a lot of things. And I close with this. How many of you knew that we had, who was just doing it? Girl, come on up here. No, no, no. I just want to say thank you. No, come on. Oh, you had the mic? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, George Betty. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you and to say to this audience, how lucky we are collectively to have our majority whip, the most powerful man in this nation who makes presidents and who guides us. Thank you, Jim. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Don't go too far because you and I are paying together in about five minutes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you all so much for being here. Let me close with this. How many of you all knew that we had absorbed to the tune of $1.6 billion, all of the capital improvement loans that the HBCU had, HBCUs had pending. I go around the country and people don't know that. These science buildings, these academic halls, all that were built on these campuses, because of COVID, we used the COVID money to excuse them of $1.6 billion dollars in debt. They are debt free. Debt free. And we, that's the kind of stuff we need to tweet. Tweet that out. And I've talked to people all over this country and I have not seen a single one of them yet that ever tweeted that we did that. That's what, and this kind of stuff is going on. Let's tweet some positive stuff. Let's get our the children, our students, engage in helping to build a more perfect union and stop retweeting this foolishness that people are trying to drive wedges in our community because they're trying to turn the clock back. That's what they're trying to do. And if they turn you against me, hell, I'm 82 years old. Shit, I'm gonna be gone. I'm gonna be gone. But I got a grandson that's 28 years old and is running my campaign, and I need to run, he need to win this campaign so there can some, be something here for him. So let's stop this foolishness and let's get on, get serious about making our communities better, making this a better country, and stop this craziness. They are winning because some, we are helping them. That's it.